feel free to come more often. <laughs> or uh, you can check them out on our website, Kimana.io. In the article section, we post almost every talk, um, a video uh, of that on our website. Um, and if you have suggestions or you yourself would like to give a presentation, uh, please let me know. I'm Becky Hyde. I'm a product manager here at the DAC, um, and I'm always looking for new speakers. Uh, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Gardner to talk to us about TFS. Hello. This is going to work. <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. All right. So uh, I'm not going to bore you guys with a lot of slideware. We're just going to do a demo today. So who here know, has heard the phrase, the acronym TFS? Okay, so a lot of people. Who has uh, heard TFS is only good for .NET? Or who here only thinks TFS is a source control uh, engine? Okay, so, so there, there's a handful, but that's actually a lot better than I was expecting. So a lot of us are probably familiar with TFS primarily from its first iteration. So it's been, around, it's been a product for Microsoft since 2000-ish.
So acceptance criteria, very subjective uh, within the team process. I mean, it's just like writing a story that you have today. Um, we're just doing it in a slightly different form, right? Uh, other things in here that are important, it links. So when I created that story as a child item of my, my feature uh, within that hierarchy, I automatically have a link to that. If there are other stories in here that are related that I want to add to those, I can do that as well. I can come in here and I can add related links to other stories. Mo most importantly, as I create bugs, I can associate my bugs in here so I have that chain of where did this bug come from? What work is related to it? Uh, we use a lot in our team. We use impediments to track like uh, external dependencies that are slowing down our work. So we'll leave those a lot of times here. And then we can generate queries in the backside uh, to show us. And actually, that might be a decent thing to look at real quick. Uh, okay. Uh, we can generate queries that we can then use to decorate our dashboard. So these give us like. These are ways that we can track key performance indicators for our team as far as like uh, things that we care about. And one of ours is like impediments, like external dependencies and things like that. Uh, so we can track uh, my impediments. So right now we have 26 impediments blocking 26 work items on our backlog, right? <coughs> these, these kinds of queries are driven through those relationships that we work. So that's kind of like the core, like one of the mo most important uh, aspects of PFS is this relationship of work and the linking of, of work to stuff within the platform. So uh, work is sort of your foundation. Like it, it is the reason that we're doing whatever we're doing, right? So everything that we do within the platform typically is going to be associated with work item, and it's going to build out as links within that work item. And that gives you, as your story is moving through your process and whatnot, you can tr you get traceability back to those different artifacts. Um, so that's a really important uh, aspect there. So my story. This is not at all awkward. <laughs> uh, I'm doing a quick search here to find my story, and then there it is. Okay, so we've got some acceptance criteria defined for it. We've got links associated with it, uh, history and traceability. So not much is going on with it yet, but as this story, as things change, as, you know, I do things to it as update criteria as I add code check-ins, whatever, like we're gonna see this history start to build out and that again is just building more context of like what is it that we're doing and why are we doing it. Um, 
you can, so for other like quick things, if you are, uh, so in like the, uh, the, the agile terminal, terminology, you are a chicken and not a pig on this story, so if you're, you're involved but not uh, committed to it, uh, you can follow stories, so this is a way like if, um, like if a product owner or as a state, external stakeholder to a team, if you need to be able to follow like, what's going on with a particular story, you can come in here and click this button and you'll get notifications that that uh, progresses. <coughs> For product owners and things like that, there's um, templates. So if you find yourself creating lots of stories that are the same type over and over again, you can leverage templates to save you some time there. You can also create copies of work items and you can split work items. Uh, so if work carries over from one iteration to the next, uh, then this is, these are some tools that will do with that. Yeah. All right, so story created. So now we actually want to work on the story, right? So let me put my filters so we can sort of we're actually So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull the story into ready uh, because I am matured it, so you know it, 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 it's it's ready. Um, but really what we want to do is we actually want to go ahead and get started working on this. So we pull the story over into uh, into in progress. I'm gonna assign it to myself, uh, find myself something to work on. And then what I can start doing is I can start adding artifacts to so as a developer, if like, you know, there's certain tasks that I need to, to do in here that aren't necessarily accepting criteria in the story, like, I don't know, I can create a repository uh, and create a build definition. Uh, I can start creating tasks on my story, and these are separate artifacts that I can track uh, as well against myself. So these are things that I can make many complete as I'm working on, my, working on my story and getting it done. I can also, in case you didn't notice, I can add test cases. So if I'm doing a test-driven development <coughs> process, if I'm TDD team, then I can start out by just going ahead and writing my, my test criteria. Should show the world on the page. You know, whatever. Uh, more descriptive test cases. Uh, these things automatically will create test cases in this test hub up here, which then we can tie those back to uh, our stories and whatnot. And we can create test plans driven based on requirements in our backlog. Um, so think about like if you had a feature have a bunch of work items full of that feature and then all those work items have test cases associated with them. You can create a test plan focused on that feature that will aggregate for you all of the test cases that are associated with all of that work. And then therefore you could give that to a tester if you wanted to and they could run through and execute all those test cases against that feature. And then you know whether or not your feature met its requirements, right? Like what is the quality of that feature based on the execution of the test cases? Are they all passing or failing? And you can do automation with that as well. There's a lot here, I'm not gonna to get to all of it, so I'm trying to point out things that are there uh, and just be aware that they exist. And you can, you know, if you have questions about that, we can talk about those later. All right, so story is created. So what's the next thing that I'm gonna do? The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna write some code. So I'm gonna create a branch. I've already preemptively created a repository, but my repository is empty at the moment. Um, so we're gonna create a new repository based off this node demo repo. Uh, so Mark is the branch. How many people are familiar with Git? Okay, and how many people are familiar with the concept of the Git flow for development? Okay, so quick primer on this. So the way, when you, so Git repositories are decentralized version control repositories. TFS also still supports centralized repositories, a traditional TFBC, um, SVN style repository where everybody checks in and checks out from a server copy. Uh, but with Git, you have local copies uh, and it, the flow of work within a Git-based repository is that each story generally will create its own topic branch. And so that allows me to isolate my work uh, away from the rest of the team so that we don't have to worry about like, you know, so-and-so checked in something and looking for my work, I can work on myself in isolation. And I'm done with it, I can then merge it back into the master branch. Um, so that, if you notice, that flow is built into TFS like from the story. So starting with the story, I'm creating a new branch to do my development on this on this story. Uh, it's automatically associating that work item with my, with my branch so that all check-ins that I do against the branch will automatically have that linkage to the story. Again, traceability. And I'm just gonna keep saying that word over and over because it's the most exciting thing. Uh, all right, so we're creating our branch. And it kicks me over into the repository. What I need to do now is I need to clone this thing. So I'm gonna copy this URL and I'm gonna switch over into, I prefer PowerShell. Okay, 
everybody can see that, right? Fairly clear. Cool. So I'm just going to clone that repository. Which I'm on Wi-Fi, so get a slow test. Alright, so we've got a clone now of that repository in our local space. We're going to change into it. checking out the branch that I just created. So for now, uh, on that same branch that I just created, any work that I do here will automatically get, um, or not automatically, but when I push it up, it'll get pushed into that branch on the remote repository as well. Um, that's, this is all like get stuff. Um, there's actually was, I don't know, like two months ago, three months ago, there was a really good uh, lecture learn here on get fundamentals. So if you haven't seen that yet, actually go out to the <laughs> and, and look it up on there. It's up on there. It was Jason McCreary's talk yeah. called You Don't Know Git. Yeah, fantastic. He did, he did a really great job on it. So, uh, so yeah. I'm not going to cover that. We're, I'm just going to assume a fundamental understanding. Most of you can, if there are like, like critical questions, please pop up any of All right, so we've got that. So now we need to actually do something. Uh, my personal uh, code editor uh, of your choice is Visual Studio Code. Do not consider that with Visual Studio. I'm not opening Visual Studio. Uh, this is Visual Studio Code, which uh, is actually a Chrome application. I think it's built on top of Adam's the editor uh, behind the scenes. Uh, predominantly just a text editor. That's, that's the main thing. There's no magic here. We're just editing text files. Um, so I am in my repository. And now what we need to do is we actually need to create some stuff. Uh, so first thing that I need to do, uh, actually I think all I really need to do. So we're going to do a basic node app here. Disclosure, I'm not that great at uh, I pretty much think I'm a copy paste uh, kind of guy when it comes to code to node. So we're going to drop a hello world app in here. So that's pretty much it, right? That's that is a, a node application hello world. Uh, for what this thing does, uh, it sets up a listener on port 3000 uh, on localhost, and anybody that submits a HTTP GET request to it, it's going to return the word to So all that did, uh, magic behind the scenes, NPM is a package management for Node. Uh, we just initialized the NPM repository, the NPM, uh, yeah, the NPM local repository in this uh, folder, and that's it. So now we're going to do an install Express, which I didn't save, so that thing is going to Express, by the way, is a framework for running web applications on Node.js. Saving dependencies is an important concept here. Uh, so what this does is when you initialize an NPM repository, uh, it creates a packages.json file within your, uh, within your local code repo. And what this does is it keeps track of all the dependencies that your application needs in order to execute. Uh, and so what this means is that when I go to build this on the build server, it's going to know that uh, it's going to automatically know that it needs to download and load Express version 4.15.3, I think is what that says, uh, in order for my application to run. So
functioning application. This <coughs> works on my local machine. Now what do I do with it? So now we actually need to get it built and deployed onto our infrastructure. So back to this guy. So. So this will basically synchronize my local code changes up to uh, the remote repository so that other people can see them and that we can start to do some more interesting things with it. So before I proceed any further, the kind of next thing that we're going to jump to is we need to do some uh, foundational work, which actually I, I had defined back on my work item, uh, but I already checked the task, but we're going to go do it anyway. So what we need to do is we need to create a build definition for this application, uh, and then subsequently we also want to create a release definition for it. So what these things are going to do is they're going to set up uh, our who here is familiar with continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines? All right, so a few people. Uh, so continuous integration, we'll start there. So continuous integration is the concept that every time that a change is made, uh, that you want to constantly integrate that change back into the main line of your application. And kind of the idea there is that if I'm constantly doing that, then I'm um, preemptively heading all of the merge conflicts or conflicts where I've made a change and somebody else has made a change and those, those changes don't work. Right? So if I'm constantly integrating, then I'm constantly getting feedback about whether or not my change is actually compatible with the current state of the application. So uh, continuous integration is the uh, application, like continuous integration builds are an application of that. Uh, and when we talk about continuous integration, we think continuous integration builds or CI builds, what we tend to think of them as is we think of them as quality gains. So they act as like first line defense for somebody making a bad change to our code and that getting out into a production environment. Uh, so CI builds are, are meant to stop that. So first check is just, does the, app, does the application actually build after that person has made a change? If it doesn't build, then obviously that change isn't going anywhere. Uh, the second thing is typically like unit testing. A lot of times, you know, code changes come along with corresponding unit, unit tests, and you want to run those tests as part of your CI build to make sure that the, that the, that the test pass and that you haven't broken any pre-existing assumptions about the logic of the patent. Uh, and then you're going to have some additional ones. Uh, popular ones within the enterprise, we use a lot of, like, who knows what sonar cube is. Like, we use sonar cube a lot. Uh, code quality. So those are code quality analysis tools. Uh, those are embedded into our, into our CI build as well. So that we can run through and we can verify, is the change that was made to our application, is that a good quality change? Do we actually want, you know, have we increased our technical debt or have we decreased our technical debt? Hopefully the latter, right? Otherwise, we're looking at a maintainability nightmare as we move forward. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to to create a build. Uh, conveniently enough, right here at the top of my repository, it asked me to set up a build, so I just click that button. Uh, creating a new build definition. Uh, so there's templates in here for existing applications. So if I were using runs for gold, uh, which are just like ask at executioners within VM, uh, I could select one of these. Actually, we'll just go ahead and do this. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll just strip out the task. So I, I'm going to use an existing template, uh, but there's also the option if, if none of these templates apply to my particular scenario, then I can always just start with an empty build definition and, and build out whatever is appropriate for the technology that I'm working on. But in our case, uh, this is good enough. So we'll go ahead and create this. Uh, it automatically will do the wiring up for me. So it's wiring it up to my repository, uh, my node demo. It's, mas it's wiring it up to my master branch, which is important. Um, like master is you know, the authoritative source uh, for this application. It is where uh, all of my production builds should be generated from. I will have lots of, particularly with Gitflow, I'm going to have lots and lots of development branches, but I will only ever have one master branch. And master branch is the important one. Uh, so I'm going to set up this, this particular build to queue off of my master branch. I'm going to go ahead and check this box here for continuous integration, uh, meaning that it's going to build that every single time. You also notice up here that I can connect to other source repositories. Like I have, you, I'm using the, the integrated uh, Git repository within my team project, but there's no reason I couldn't hook this up to GitHub uh, to for Enterprise to, uh, if you're an Atlassian fan, like you could hook this up to Bitbucket or anything else, right? Like any other standard Git repository, if it has an endpoint, a web addressable endpoint, you can hook it up. Uh, sub Subversion as well. So for some of you that are still using Subversion repositories, I'm sorry. Uh, 
but you are supported, so if you want to, you, if you want to generate CI builds out of your subversion, you can do so. Uh, but we're going to use the default one built in. So we're going to go ahead and create our build definition. Uh, because we use the template, it's automatically going to populate some tasks in here. So the concept of a build definition is basically just uh, a, tax, a serial task execution engine. So the idea being there's some general context around what is it that I'm building, uh, and then what are the tasks in order that I need to execute within that build definition. Uh, in this case, it's, it's going to do an npm install. This goes back to that uh, dependency resolution file, that packages.json that we created earlier. So this thing's going to automatically restore all of those dependencies that my application needs in order for it to, to execute. So it's going to do an install. Uh, gulp task, we're not going to do that because we don't actually have any gulp tasks ex for execution. Uh, and then it's going to do an archive. And actually, I don't think really, like, I, I don't really want to do that. So really, all we want to do is we want to do that in EM install, uh, and then we're going to publish it. So what this will do is it'll take that, that, that it's going to restore those dependencies, it's going to plug all that together, and then it's going to publish that as a build artifact into our artifact repository. And in this case, we're, our artifact repository is just going to be the TFS server itself. You can also point it out if you have like, a file share somewhere, you can dump all of your build artifacts out to a centralized repository or centralized So the question was, are uh, external Git repositories of the triggers automatically firing? Um, so they should be, and if they are not, another way that you can solve this is through service hooks. And service hooks basically allow you to hook into uh, standard like webhook APIs and trigger events within your team project based on those. So you can see here, like you set up a bunch within Slack, uh, you can do the same thing um, with it, like, uh, like if you have Git for Enterprise or GitHub or whatever, you can set up a hook there and have it fire off your build for you. All right, so build. So let's actually go ahead and queue build. So let's watch this thing build. I have not pulled my brain. 
turning to the master, so nothing's going to happen. This build's not going to do anything. OK, uh, so that was actually what I wanted to talk about. So how do we get the code change that I made in my branch into my master branch? Uh, because the master branch is the one that generates the build. It's Mark's dev branch is never going to generate the build. The master branch is generating the build. And notice when I drop in here that it's already suggesting to me, hey, I see that you have changes. Uh, would you like to create a pull request? So pull request is, a, again, it's a get concept. Um, that what it does is it, it, it's, a, it's synonymous with like a code review. So the idea being that it will take all the changes that I've committed to my branch, my development branch, it'll compare those against the master branch, it'll generate a report for that, and then it will show that to my team and say, hey, you guys improved with this change and do you want to merge into your master branch? So again, sort of that first line of defense, these quality gates that we inject in our process to make sure that we're doing the right things along the way. The other thing that you'll notice is that, again, hey, look, <coughs> context, context is everything. It's telling me what is the change that I made um, in terms of what are these yeah, I did two files, and here's the contents of those files. Uh, here's his commit log. You know, would it, would it be use his commit messages when he, when he committed it to his Git repo? <coughs> oh, by the way, here is a story that is associated with this work so that you understand context, right? So we can see all of this tracing through. Uh, before I do that, there's one other thing that I actually want to show. So you can configure <coughs> policies on your repositories uh, to enforce these kinds of behaviors. So down here, So, uh, branch policies allow us to enforce certain behaviors. So, uh, one thing, automatically build pull requests, so we can set up gated builds, basically. So the idea being that when I submit a pull request to merge something into master, it's gonna go and take that build, it's gonna behind the scenes, it's gonna merge that into master, create like a tertiary branch off to the side, and it's gonna go and it's gonna try to build that. Uh, and so then I'm getting, again, it's all about feedback and short cycle loops on that feedback. I'm getting that feedback immediately, about, hey, does that change that he's trying to pull in the master, does that succeed? And now I'll get a notification in the pull request, like there'll be a little note at the top that says build succeeded or build failed. Mm -hmm. So the person who's looking at the pull request will know, well, you know, it looks okay, but it failed, it failed, it failed to be the build, I, I'm gonna reject this. And then that change gets kicked back, to, kicked back to the developer to work on it some more until they've actually figured it out. Um, requirements for approval. Uh, so within a team, you can typically These are our code review requirements down here. So we, within a team, we can define how many people have to approve a pull request before it comes in. Um, typically, you know, two is a good number. Uh, in our situation, because I'm doing this demo by myself, we're going to say one, and we're also going to check this box that says I'm allowed to approve my own pull request. Typically, you don't want to do that. Typically, you want somebody else within the team approving the pull request. Uh, but we're going to cheat. Um, and okay, so back up to this guy. Squash merges again. These are like good specific things. Uh, so squash merge is generally a good idea. Um, like when I'm working on a branch locally for development, I'm gonna have tons and tons of commits. It's gonna be really noisy. I don't want to pull all that commit uh, history <coughs> into master. So squash will just basically smash that all down. So it looks like one commit going into my master branch. Um, linked work items. We use this one heavily. Basically, if you're doing work and it doesn't have a linked work item, then what are you really doing? Um, like that, that's a good question, right? Like you're doing some sort of unaccountable that's a bad thing. So all work that's going into any of my repositories has to have a work item associated with it. Otherwise, you're, you know, you're off the reservation and you're doing something that you should be doing. You're trying to hide something from me. Um, so we typically will block pull requests that don't have a work item associated with it. Uh, so, no questions, okay. So we're gonna go ahead and save these policies on our branch so that we can actually see them enforced when I create this pull request. So I'm gonna create this pull request, pull my changes into the master branch, because it didn't, didn't catch them the first time. Okay. Oh, I guess I guess this is actually I did set up a gate build that. Okay, so then right here are our policies being evaluated automatically. We you know it's telling us nobody's actually approved this yet, but I get a nice screen check mark because I have a work item associated with it. So meaning that if I'd had a gated build, we'd see that up here as well. It would say you'd see the build running and once it succeeded, you'd either see a red X or a green check telling you whether it was all right, so uh, code reviews, really interesting process here. So what's really nice is that I can come in here and you can actually have a public dialogue around the discussion around the code change that's being made. So like, you know, as a reviewer, I can come in here and say, I don't like this, and I can comment that. The 
developer will get a notification that, hey, somebody commented, do you want to look at it? And then I can come back in here and I can say, uh, I don't care what's wrong. Um, and we're not going to fix that. So we get this nice little dialogue, and this all tracks it up here uh, to see like what's happening with this code review, uh, what changes have they been made. So if you know I had actually made a change and pushed an update here, we'd see that happening. We'd see this timeline and all these events going on with this pull request. Uh, so you get like all this again transparency and traceability around what's actually happening with the work. So ultimately, looks good. We're going to approve it and we're going to complete this. But before I do, I need to jump ahead to the next thing. So when we complete a bit, when we complete a merge, it's on actually. Yeah, yeah, this works like, this is language non-specific. So the question was, does this work with uh, other language? It's language non-specific, anything, because I mean, code is all text, it's all text. So uh, I will tell you that binary, so if you're checking in like media assets, like images, or if you're, God forbid, checking in DLLs or, or other binary compatible assemblies, those will just show up as blobs here. You can have conversations about the file as a whole, uh, so there's the ability with but you cannot comment directly within the content of binary, right? Because it's just binary. Uh, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and delete this merge. Uh, then go ahead, pull the change in our master branch and start the build. So when we did that, which I gave that away, it's gonna fire all of our builds. So if we kick over to builds, builds tab. You're gonna see the new queue build. demo build right here. So this automatically got kicked off when our pull request merged into the master branch. Uh, so it's running behind the scenes. Uh, I'll get a notification when it completes whether it was successful or not, um, which is really nice. But before that gets there, we're going to go and go on to the next step. So we built the application, now we actually need to deploy this. So my big promise here was that I was going to be able to deploy to a Linux server uh, and we'll actually get that done. So we're going to create a new release and in this situation none of these apply, so we're going to go with an empty. Oh, by the way, you can create custom templates uh, for your own build and release definitions. So if you have a particular pattern of application that you're building and releasing frequently, you can create templates to support those. Uh, but again, we'll go that. Uh, what are we building from? So you have some options here. You can build, you can, or sorry, where are we deploying from? You can deploy from a build artifact if you produce a build definition. If we're a Jenkins, if we have a Jenkins server somewhere, we can associate ourselves with Jenkins builds, pick their artifacts, deploy them. Or, you know, I don't really know what it is I'm hooking up to yet. I'm just going to build a release definition and later I'll associate with some sort of artifact. Uh, in our situation, we're just we're going to tie it straight to our build. So our build is in here. Node my build. When all of these chocolate uh, chocolate no build. There we go. We're going to set continuous deployment. Continuous deployment, much like continuous integration, is triggered automatically. So as soon as any successful build uh, in of this of this definition executes, this release definition is automatically going to fire. Um, so we're going to go ahead and create that. So this looks a lot like the build definition construct. We have again just tasks that we can configure within the serial execution uh, for the release. It adds one additional dimension, though. It adds the concept of environment. Uh, so this is, like you would think, it's environments. I've got dev, I've got test, I've got prod. Um, so we'll create a couple of environments here. I'm not going to use them all, but we'll create them to see them. Environments have some special attributes around them. So I can assign approvals to them. This is kind of the, the bread and butter of a release workflow. I can come in here and define who is allowed to approve a new release into an environment and out of an environment. Uh, so this basically, think of uh, pre-deployment approvers as me uh, acting as a check to make sure that you're not deploying like in the middle of me doing something. So if, like this one, get the QA environment, right? And I had a new deployment, and I was just pushing it in there every time it was available. Well, how does that impact the, the ongoing testing that's happening in that environment, right? Like you want to have some sort of control over when those deployments happen so that you can choose whether or not now is a good time to receive that build in that environment. Uh, and that's the concept of Post deployment is sort of the, uh, all right, the, the build was deployed into our environment, we ran whatever validation was appropriate to that environment, and we give it a thumbs up and it's ready to go on, right? So that would be after I've completed all my tests and all my tests were successful, I would give it a post deployment approval and let it move to the next environment. Uh, 
these are, you can do complex orchestrations of approvals, so you can do logical hands, logical cores, groups, individuals, any combination thereof. Um, you just basically list them out. Uh, so we will, we will do one approval here for me, and we only be the approver. Obviously, that's not you know, how that should actually work, but we're going to do it. Uh, I want to get an email notification whenever there's something to need my approval. So, um, other things that are specific to environments, variables. Uh, back to those database connection strings, um, you can define those here as well. If you, if you want to, if you have environment specific ones, you would create you know, a connection string for QA, a connection string for dev. Each, each environment would have its own specific version of that variable, and you could then do substitution within the environment context. Uh, deployment conditions allow us to control how, I'm so pressed on time, I'm going to try and make this. Uh, so, deployment conditions allow us to control. Um, what happens when we have multiple releases going to the same target environment? Uh, we can choose whether they, they uh, overwrite each other, they all go at once, they go serially, or just the latest one goes. Typically, I, I always want like the, the, the most recent one. Uh, oh, and then there's also environment triggers. This allows you to create your workflow um, between like dev and dev. So test only gets deployed after a successful release in dev, so on and so forth. All right, so let's actually build this release and see if we can get it working. So we're going to add a task. Uh, in our particular case here, we are going to copy some files over SSH. Get rid of that one. Let's copy files. Copy files over SSH. We're going to add that to deploy to the Linux server. And then what we're going to actually do, and then what we're going to do is we're going to run uh, a shell script. Obviously, you would have some sort of delegated credential going in here. But for now, we're going to use mine. If you're familiar with SSH, you can use private key instead of explicit credentials. Okay, so we got that created. We're going to refresh. So we're going to start a separate source folder, which in our case is just uh, this guy. We're going to copy everything that's in that folder, and we're going to put it into a folder called demo uh, on the target. And then for execution of the thing, So secured variables are protected. Like you can't actually get to those um, even programmatically. They're, they're protected. So then we'll reference that variable. Yeah. And we'll so this basically just executes no So we didn't look at this part, but you'll notice there's my work item again. It's following me through all my release. So I can see when I'm releasing something into an environment, what is it that I'm actually releasing? I'm releasing 
this work, right? Like I'm releasing these stories. Uh, I can view it both at this dimension and I can also go back if I want and look at uh, my environment overview, which of course will fail. Uh, but it would also show me uh, at this level, it's gonna show me what version of my application is in each of my environments. So if we go back to So here's some other stories, for example. Like you can see right now what, what version of our application is in each of our environments uh, across the board. You get a view of that. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time at this point. So, questions? Yeah. So one way that you can, uh, so the question was, how can I get uh, variables, like empty variables, uh, undefined variables, into my build and release templates? Uh, so there's a concept of your library. Library allows you to create variable groups. Uh, you could create a variable group that was empty, that just didn't have any values in it, allow them to reference that within their release definition, and then go ahead and fill the, fill the explicit values. Okay, and secondly, So it, it's coming, um, it's not there yet. So the next release of DFS will have some additional cleanup to the UI here. Uh, it's still, we're still probably a couple more iterations out before it really gets to where you want. So the question was basically about how can I order, order, organize my release views so that I'm not having to see everything, I can see only the stuff that pertains to my team. Uh, so what we have within the build tab, and build tends to be feature-wise a little bit ahead of release, uh, is to have the concept of folders, so you can uh, that same construct is coming to the release tab, it's just a little bit further down. If you want to be explicit about that, like you don't want particular uh, people seeing uh, builds or releases, you can at the security level, you can review, re remove their view access to it and not take it off their screen. So then you can control within security groups, basically this team can see these releases, this team can see these other releases, and they can't see each other. So what you can do is you can export build definitions. So all this stuff, uh, all of this is driven by REST API behind the scenes. Um, so basically it means all these artifacts are being stored in JSON somewhere. So you can export the JSON artifacts and you can source control those if you want. And if you need to re-import them later, you can import them as a build definition. It's not going to archive like the history of the build, it would just archive this build definition itself. Another thing, so releases you can't do, but builds, builds you can create an archive folder and then just store all your builds. Questions? How do I learn more? How do you? Oh, that's, that's totally a plan. Uh, all right, so uh, we're very active on Buzz. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about DFS, go to Buzz, not this topic, go to Buzz, Groups, DevOps. Uh, we have a, we have a, okay. uh, this is the DevOps Buzz Group. Uh, we have some links over here for additional information and self-learning if you're interested. You can also engage with us here on this channel if you'd like.